and welcome to another Wrestling Roundtable Discussion Podcast. I'm Adam Wilborn from What Culture, joined by the Dadly Boys of What Culture, Michael Hamplett and Michael Sidgwick, to discuss another burning wrestling issue. But before we get into it, if you're a fan of this sort of thing, make sure you subscribe to What Culture Wrestling on either iTunes or Spotify for daily podcasts where we review pay per views, Raw, SmackDown. We have interviews, more roundtable discussions like this one, and a round of the week complete with a bloody good quiz, of course, on wrestle culture. But gents, following Monday Night Raw, it's been announced that we are the authority. Yeah, I'm really looking forward result. to this. I'm Great looking result. forward to doing this. It's about bloody time. <laughs> uh, so with that in mind, how do we make Monday Night Raw good again? <laughs> it's a hard task, this. Isn't it? <laughs> it's legitimately quite hard. Um... We've got free reign to do what we want. Absolutely. We are the authority. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is make these goobers write and perform their own promos. Sack the writing team. It's only Vince anyway. They are so redundant. It's unreal. And I've written this before, but if they had unscripted promos, obviously, like, the, the booker, Vince, wants to get the story beats across. But how you present them is both vital to your character and the reception to it. Now, only th one of three things can happen under this model, and only one of three things did. One, you get really over organically. Two, you don't really say much of anything, which is exactly what happens now, because when was the last time you could recall word for word a wrestling promo in WWE? It just doesn't happen. C, you get banter. You get Sid not knowing if he's up bloody live or anything like that. You get Kelly still doing good lucha things. So you get, th <laughs> you get three things... One of them's really, really good, can create a legendary career full of legendary moments. Two, the same bloody thing that happens now. Or C, three, just pure bloody schadenfreude, which is the best bit about wrestling for me right now. It's watching them fail. It's great. <laughs> what would you do? Well, like, as much as I'm tempted to go with holograms of dead wrestlers, because the ones that are still alive that they currently use are awful. Like, I'm sick of those legends, so can we not, like, ape the music industry and just, like, put on matches with, like, all your old favourites? <laughs> like, I'm trying to keep this within the realms of possibility, um, because Vince McMahon was saying he was going to offer us a solution to Monday Night Raw and just made us do the work for him. I'd like to see... Um, NXT finally overhauled to something of like a league system I'd like to see these wrestlers, some of the ones that Sidgwick references there that like are just complete goobers complete losers, potentially threatened with the punishment of a relegation and a promotion system similar to like how you know football leagues work and stuff like that I support a team that has suffered relegation twice Adam Wilborn is on the like the precipice of a third relegation for his football team mm -hmm. you're made to suffer for your inherent systemic failings so let the wrestlers that suffer in this like fake world of WWE suffer real consequences of it similarly let those ones within xt who we might say oh we want to see get a push we want to see get elevated get elevated based on merit if you watch on monday night raw and you see the video packages of these nxt guys coming up it's as if vince just told triple h can you bring the eight by tens to work please i want to have a look he's seen ec3 big muscles he's seen heavy machinery big lads he's seen um, lars sullivan lars sullivan big muscles all of these people are stereotypical guys that vince McMahon likes having never even once turned on his WWE network to see nxt and seeing the guys that maybe could be getting elevated through talent do you Vince has the network? I don't, why would he bother? Why would he need it? Like he, like, he might as well just watch what he sees on that screen in Gorilla every week and be like, nah, I don't fancy this. He probably doesn't even like flick over to the network. He probably checks out Netflix. Yeah. I certainly would. Um, but no, I would like to see a bit more of a kind of cohesion between what NXT is because I think we can accept that the current model of call-ups is, is, a, is a failing model. Mm -hmm. It's failing the talent. It's failing the guys on the main roster who could do with that breath of fresh air in full sail. So I'd like to see a little bit more fluidity between the two rosters. Absolutely. There's been a lot of talk recently of, of Tyler Breeze, obviously, who went back. Mm -hmm down yeah. uh, to face Ricochet in a great match and uh, looked really good um, this week on Raw as, as well. As a fan of NXT's Golden Era, that felt really nice as well. I got to see the Tyler Breeze that I remember falling in love with all them years ago rather than the guy that is sent out as, as he was this week, Dean Ambrose's token jobber. And even, he looked good in that match, but you just felt there's so much more that they could do with him. And I remember a while back people talking about Dolph Ziggler potentially going back to NXT and having, not back to NXT, but going to NXT and having matches there. That could really work if you allow more, like you say, more fluidity between the, the brands. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just um, between Raw and NXT either. Like, it's too much like hard work, but I'm not a hack writer. Go to whatculture.com, you'll know. Um, for years now... The whole episodic TV model with like a recurring cast of characters on Raw and SmackDown, even though under Vince is less scrutin scrutinized, it's a lot better. 
a recurring cast of the same old characters on a three-hour TV show is destined to fail, irrespective of who that talent is and who that cast is. The want for me to emulate the jump ship who's going to jump mm -hmm. and when in the Monday Night Wars. Like, it was so thrilling to know that someone's contract was coming up and they might appear and get completely refreshed and it's in still a different is. company. Let's not pretend that they're all the buzz around the elite at the moment. That still exists. Oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah that's a thing. It's a constant. About, yeah. It's a constant. And eventually, especially on Raw, because it's three hours long, I know there's been that big debate recently about how hard it is to write. Surely it can be better than this. Mm -hmm. It can be, and it has been in the past. But there does come a point where... If you have the same guys doing the same thing for three hours a week, it's just no one can write like that. No one can write to benefit all of them in different flattering roles with the same cast of characters. No one's ever had to do it because before the Monopoly, no one ever had to. Mm. And it's telling for me that it's only like episodic television has only become so putrid and unwatchable when there's been one dominant league in town. So now that they've got these different arms of the company, they can emulate what worked in the past and get the ratings up while they do it. I'll say this for the writing team about this week's Raw that we were told repeatedly on commentary. Like, obviously, every week, Michael Cole has notes about the things he's got to repeat ad nauseum. So get rid of Michael Cole, incidentally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This week, it was fresh and new and everything that Vince had talked about in that long opening segment before he delivered a rehash of something that happened on the pay-per-view the night before when Baron Corbin got beaten down. But one of the only moments where it actually felt organically fresh was in Shane McMahon's little backstage with the Authors of Pain, mm -hmm. where he said, no, we're going to do away with... He didn't say it in as many words, but it was like, the idea was we're going to do away with this, like, entire titled attitude of, well, I'll get a rematch, so who cares? That, in essence, is like... That's a big one. Yeah, it's, it's kind of WWE's, like, how do we fill television, like, model of the last few years, like, in a microcosm, because it's like, well, the match you watched last night already doesn't matter, because here it is again. And what if, like, they win the belts back? Then that th that feud, theoretically, never, ever ends. So the authors of pain were put into a match, which they subsequently lost. So they're now out of the runnings, and they're made to suffer for their failings as performers. I'd like to see the writing staff acknowledge some of these like these tropes that the company have lent on over the years, some of these terrible things. They did it with Teddy Long to a point about always having a tag match or always having The Undertaker. That became a meme, but it didn't really stop them doing it. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see more of those tropes that have kind of pummeled the viewers over the years, like Wrestler A comes out and does this because that's just what Wrestler A does. If they kind of out, if they out themselves are saying, we're not going to do that anymore. I think it like, that is a sense of actually feeling like this, this like dreary product is actually being shaken up. Is it worth sort of reinventing how we open the show? Because we've seen over many years there was a period of time where every week they came out and cut promos. And there's also been times where every week they just sort of drag out the same people to have an opening match on, on Monday Night Raw. Is it worth refreshing something yeah, like that? Absolutely. Mm. Like, how much have people genuinely got to say from one programme to the next about that programme to warrant a 20-minute promo? This is why like, you'll never go back and think now to, I don't know, August, can you think? Can you remember one promo that was cut on there? Hardly any. Like, no. I, don't, I can't tell you when the Elias Kevin Owens was was in the summer, but that was something that stuck out. Oh uh, yeah, the, you know the big Elias segment where they got the local sports team heat in Seattle. I think yeah, it was. it was in Seattle, but yeah. I can't remember the month. But that's the point. Is there's, there's so little heat in any of these things that that doesn't justify the reason to carry them on as long yeah. as they go. I've got an idea. Go on. Start a wrestling show with a wrestling match. I, I don't get it. I don't understand you know how I mean? anyone like a star this? in a wrestling match. Just like, just this. You know, <laughs> you can even do like a backstage segment. Like, if they have to have someone talk because it's a three hour long show, like, talk about like what they've done to prepare for the match. You know, like, add a bit more of a sports element, which to me leads on to my next point that my ultimate, apart from scripted promos, my ultimate bugbear with that bloody company this year, especially, it's become so toxic throughout, is an emphasis on comedy. And not just in the undercard, which is absolutely fine. It's part of the complexion of sports entertainment. It's why it's different to the other like traditional wrestling promotions. Mm -hmm. And honestly, when you look at something like the Festival of Friendship, I wouldn't change that WWE for some kind of weird simulation of New Japan Pro Wrestling, mm -hmm. as much as I like New Japan Pro Wrestling. You see something like the Festival of Friendship and how funny it was and how heartbreaking it was and what a tonal, multi, tonal masterpiece it was. I would never swap that for the world. But now... This comedy has crept into absolutely everything. It's pathetic. Um, if you don't want to spoil us for the Christmas Eve Raw, just mute for the next minute. Um, on the Christmas Eve Raw, Braun Strowman gets a Christmas hat and puts it on Paul Heyman in their sort of tete-a-tete -tete ahead of the Royal Rumble match. And it's like, you've got a big, big hoss fight for what is meant to be the biggest or second billest, like second biggest uh, 
surprise in the entire company between like a genuine strongman who you want to push as a serious performer against legit one of the hardest men who's ever walked this planet and you've got like a little Christmas comedy segment and it just undermines the whole thing mm -hmm. for me. It completely undermines it because I can't unsee something like that the next time they do a promo. It's like we've already ruined it now. I genuinely don't think they spot things like that happening in the writing. Um, I don't think they spot when they undermine themselves and they undercut themselves and they, they kind of like just completely strip certain characters of credibility as a result. Because as you said, that does damage to Braun as well, doesn't it? That, that presents a guy that isn't necessarily taking this situation very seriously. Well, this Braun now is markedly different to the Braun of 2017, mm. who I used to watch and like through the eyes of a child almost, like this big destructive monster who was really, really dangerous and did loads of OTT stuff. He like, the Tron onto Brock Lesnar. Yeah, I know. From backstage. Like, but I believe he's failed in... profoundly against him in matches twice. Yeah. So this is the time to, to show be serious. serious this yeah, time, yeah, exactly. So now you got stuff like this. And he was actually so good at the comedic side that I think it did him in in the end. He was too good at it. It's a mm. bit like Ronda Rousey selling. Like the fact he should have botched it on purpose. If, he was kind of, if there was any <laughs> kind of politics in like wrestling right now, which that was in like the 80s and 90s, someone would have had a word. And like someone that was looking yeah. out from went, don't do that. Like botch it, protect yourself. Botch it on purpose. Yeah. Like Terry Funk had a great quote. Um, Dolph Ziggler should listen to this ten years ago. Um, don't get too good at doing jobs, because yeah. if you're good at it, then the people who they're more predisposed to liking will take advantage. And it's a bit like this. Like just don't. Even if you're good at it, just don't do it. Like protect your character for God's sake. It's the curse of being a utility player in an era where virtually everybody is a yeah, utility player. Exactly. No stuff. Uh, in the midst of, of WE talking about all this new stuff that they're going to bring in, a slight change they could make, something that they've been hinting at anyway, is the addition of a women's tag team division. Could that be something beneficial for, for both Monday Night Raw and SmackDown, but for WWE on the whole? Yeah, it's, it's beneficial in a very sort of superficial way, I think. There's like there's probably now, for the first time, the depth. I wouldn't necessarily say the quality depth, but certainly in terms of numbers, the quantity, they now have enough on the roster and there's enough to call up and there's certainly a well of talent out there that they could mine if they wish, as they have been doing in other areas. So you could do it. But I think the only problem I have is that it very quickly becomes normalised because that's what we become accustomed to in WWE now. We get a new shiny thing that has all this great potential, all this great hope, and then very quickly it's normalised. You need bigger systemic changes such as like how an episode of Raw would begin or how characters talk to each other or talk to an interviewer or talk to the fans to matter more before another set of belts can help. The European title was introduced in 1997 um, and the British Bulldog and Owen Hart had one of the best technical wrestling matches. It's awesome if you've not seen it. It's Go so watch it. worth Go watching. Watch it. Uh, especially for that WWE at the time. It, like The 80s and 90s weren't decades that were full of outstanding matches, mm -hmm. save for very small pockets. And that match happening in Germany, no less, was there to tell the world that like the European title will mean something more and will mean something different. Shawn Michaels and the British Bulldog had a match in Birmingham. The, second the first title change, you know, second major match. The title was becoming something else. And then Sean and Triple H bantered it off on an episode of Raw, a Christmas episode of Raw, as the last thing that happened in 1997. That was the last time it ever meant a damn. Yeah, because the belt then suddenly became part of Attitude Era WWE silliness, rather than great technical wrestling that happens on international waters. It has to mean something. Like, the women's tag will have to mean something. Those belts will have to be fought over between proper teams, and we only have one, maybe two at a stretch at the moment. So it's all well and good introducing it, but if the follow-through is not there, then it just becomes a bit of an annoyance. You know, lots of titles previously have been a bit of an irritation. And I'm an sure inconvenience to yeah. them as well, as, an, as well as an annoyance to us. Um, to answer that question, I've watched the male tag team division all year long, so no. Don't want don't well, want yeah, to yeah, inspired a lot of, outside of SmackDown, they haven't inspired a great deal of confidence. Nah, 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 nah. The last thing you want is like having them be relatively credible for six months and then having like R Truth come out and challenge them. Yes. Yeah. Mixed match challenge winner R Truth. <laughs> um Another thing I was going to suggest, which is slightly more outlandish, is something that's been discussed a fair bit more in the past. Four McMahons as authority figure? <laughs> Not quite. But what I was thinking was, we had a discussion earlier about Five, Vince McMahon having three. another child. That's what's really tickled <laughs> me there. Um, was a potential off-season... <laughs> a potential off-season for WWE. Now, I don't know where this would go, mm. perhaps just after WrestleMania as a sort of, you know, season finale. We'll see you in whenever, June, July. Um, it, it probably will never hit and never happen. But could that work for WWE? They could certainly do it without doing it, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Harkening back to the 
um, sh cyclical roster idea that we had earlier. You could cycle someone out for four weeks, mm -hmm. and they bloody well should as well. To it's, it's bad that nowadays I look at WWE and there's some people I look at and I go. I really wish you'd get injured for about six months because yeah. then you'll go away. Like, there's Guys no get over by not being around. Like mm. if you think yeah. of the responses to the Owens and Zane videos from last night, that's just because they haven't been on television. Yeah. The last thing we wanted to see was Kevin Owens getting beaten up by Braun Strowman again over the summer. You know, I was ecstatic. I mean, this sounds terrible. Obviously, we, we wish them very well soon. Obviously, they've had well, Zane's had uh, double rotator cuff surgery. Uh, Owens has had double knee surgery. But once I found out they were injured, I was. In the nicest possible way, I was thinking, oh, that's great news. Yeah. I bet they were. I honestly think they probably were. I'd probably like to spend some time with their families, mm -hmm. like heal up, like refresh that enthusiasm for the business. Um, either through ethical reasons or artistic reasons, absolutely nobody that I can remember, and I've been a wrestling fan for a long time, absolutely nobody suggested an off-season in like between 1998 and 2001. No. I, abs I couldn't get enough of it, man. Yeah. Couldn't get enough of it. Um, nobody suggested it back then. The only reason why people suggest it now, sometimes under the pretense of, oh, God, they're getting hurt left, right, and the centre, or oh, it would be nice for them because the life of a wrestler is a bloody tough one. Um, the only reason why people suggest it now is because the fatigue is real. The fatigue is real. Um, if you could get a vibrant, white-hot product again, no one's wanna going to want to miss a week. And if they can get it to a position where, through booking... You can give each and every person on that roster at least a month off per year consecutively, so it actually means something. Then, yeah, no off season, but a way to cycle them out. I think you've hit upon a really good point there, actually, because good wrestling, if you're really enjoying it and if you're really excited, you never want to switch it off. That's why we're all wrestling fans. That's why we're all talking about this now. If I said to you, Do you want an off season? and your default answer is yes, I then say, Well, I'm taking Becky Lynch and Daniel Bryan off you for two months right now. And you'd be devastated because you want to watch the things mm -hmm. that you yeah. love. They're the things that get under your skin and they're the things you want to watch. If I, you know, like whatever's going to happen between like between Rumble and WrestleMania season when you're really invested in the product and it's really, really hot. If somebody says, oh, well, you can't have Ron Smackdown for two weeks. You'd be gutted because these are people with purposes doing things that you enjoy. So I think like Cedric's hit upon something there. Certainly within the Attitude Era, Mondays will be a darker place without Monday Night Raw and Nitro and everything that was happening in all those guys. Um, now, the, they have the advantage of such a vast roster, you know, and vast resources as well. It's mm -hmm. not even as if like, what if like, what if for say this one month a year or two months in a hypothetical situation, instead of having the usual giant arena Monday Night Raws, you have like a lower a lower key version of it, something that the USA Network happy to air. But if you consider like Evolution was a pay per view that took place in like a smaller venue mm -hmm. with like sort of dimmer light, it looked different for a little bit, and it's like raw off season, and it's an opportunity for guys to like get to the next level. You know, we've lasted this long without. What would we do with the content? If there was an off-season as well. Think about the content. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm only thinking about the content. <laughs> Screw the like, safety and well-being of the pros. People would have to invest in old stuff on the network and we'd be able to talk about that a little yeah, bit more. You know? Top 10 <laughs> Nick Bockwinkle <laughs> matches, which I'd love to write but would never, ever track. Uh, speaking of um, people on the internet, we always know people, what about the attitude here <laughs> in the comment sections? Um, a recent question myself and Andy Murray got sent when we were doing the news is, is there scope for WWE with their amazing money and the network that they've got now? to have some sort of alternative, more adult orientated, maybe more violent, maybe more hardcore sort of spin-off? The way I look at it now is we're just, what, two days removed from TLC? And that headline match was violent as all hell. Mm. So the violence for me, I'd rather that kind of violence, I wrapped up in an absolutely incredibly worked pro wrestling match than chair shots to the head. That was so prevalent in the attitude. Or era. blading and stuff yeah. like that. That blade's great. <laughs> Safe when done right. Well, yes, more right, as opposed to way, hard way. Way, way more blood. Yeah, right, blood I, 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 I think at times... I'm a bloodhound. At times, not Mike Kyoto busting himself open in t at TLC the other day, but at times it is justified, I think is probably the word I'd go for. Oh, absolutely. Like, the violence for me, if anything, has too much of it. Like, I don't need to see Kevin Owens like doing a cage bump in mm. the pay-per-view I can't even remember the name of was it Extreme Rules? Uh, yes yes yeah, yeah, it yeah. was like imagine thinking oh was it King of the Ring 98? <laughs> yeah, yeah it just would never happen um, I don't miss the crassness of the Attitude Era I miss the creative collaborative spirit which again you could replicate with a PG rating and you know WWE had as many if not more stars during the Golden Era more iconic moments like obviously not as many great matches, but I think that's part of the, type, the standards of the time. All with the PG rating. The PG rating for me has got nothing to do. <coughs> it's completely incidental mm -hmm. to the quality yeah. of the show. And you could replicate, again, 
the spirit of the Attitude Era by empowering the performers. I'll tell you why I think that would work as well is because I think it's pretty obvious to all of us that the Attitude Era played to Vince McMahon's base instincts in a way that he wanted it to be a bit more crass. I would rather see something creative than crass, but it's great when the Attitude Era is on because you've got both. Vince McMahon is able to do some of this ugly, offensive stuff that he clearly gets a massive kick out of, but it's in you know relation with performers that just want to go out there and mm. entertain. So if there's anything left in, in, like in the Vince McMahon that we saw last night, that with every appearance he does, he even admits it himself, he feels more weathered, he feels older, but if that's going to light a spark in him, then he's probably going to enjoy his talent a lot more. I feel like I'm watching talent Every week we've talked about this over the desks that Vincent Mann simply does not respect. Mm. I just sense that there's so, like, it's not that he doesn't want his product to be successful, but he doesn't care individually if guy A doesn't work or girl B isn't that sort of popular with the crowds because he doesn't really feel it either. It'd be nice if there was an element of the product that, like, he clearly still had the fire for. This might be Triple H's version of wrestling, and we're probably all going to be glad of it when Vincent Mann finally shuffles off. But in the, in the interim, like, the mechanisms aren't set up to support Triple H guys. They're still set up to support Vince McMahon mm. ones. Uh, final suggestions for any more improvements to WWE? Get rid of the bloody robots backstage, for Christ's <laughs> sake. Charlie Caruso, like, she's a complete non-entity. Like, if you look at the sheer personality that used to pulse through that company, Gorilla Monsoon, Mean Gino, Oakland, Howard Finkel, Bobby Heenan, mm. to, like, Todd Tom Phillips? Yeah, Tom Phillips. Todd Phillips directed the hangover. <laughs> Tom Phillips, Charlie Caruso, Dasha Fuentes, they're just they've got they're just good looking people. I don't think that's all their fault, you know. I think that's company I think they're following orders mm. to such a such a degree, the micromanagement that goes on at that level, which I'm, again but strip I'm not necessarily up, you know, blaming them. Um we can strip back the direction and possibly the personnel as well, because it is Charlie Caruso as well. Um, like they're just the uninteresting, bland, good-looking people to make it look good for the TV show, and they're young as well, and they've got very little personality about them. There's no personality on Raw anymore. It's all so cloying and glossy. Put some personality back into it. I'm going to offer the same argument, but with a very different approach. This comes up all the time. I'd like to see episodes of Monday Night Raw look different again i don't want the generic staging i understand from a brand point of view but i'm a fan i don't need to care about like the sort of the co-branding of all these events i want to see arenas looking different i want occasionally there to be an aisle that goes around a corner that requires a sweeping camera to chase a star and shoot them from below and make them walk that long walk without having to wait for a neon ramp at wrestlemania i want to see venues looking different and have a bit of personality and identity about them it never mattered where uh, early 90s superstars and challenge were taped from the venues looked different the ramp looked different it never mattered to what was happening like in the angles themselves how long the ramp was or that the titan tron looked exactly the same no matter where the traveling show turned up in sound i'd like to see like raw look different than mm. it like than it has done for the what past since 1997 well you know uh, bloody scaffolding in the 90s and we just sort of went yeah that's part of it yeah, yeah that'll do and the, the way that that the way that that set has advanced so subtly I think means that it doesn't particularly feel different since they first introduced the Titan Tron. Ultimately for me, just one last point, and I will conclude on this. I think Raw is the most ironically named program in history. <laughs> there is nothing Raw about it, but nothing Raw especially about not it. Now. Especially not now. Like, especially not now. Like back in the day, mm. like it genuinely, that's why they called it it for yeah. Christ's sake. Um, but now it's the glossiest, fakest, most rehearsed, contrived, overproduced, just awful and I love it in a way because it's so bad. <laughs> it's so bad, it's good. And I'll kind of, I think I will look back on this year and think, oh, God, wasn't it mint with all that chaos and how rubbish it was? <laughs> but ultimately, if much more of this, I will start to hate it again and not just love it. Of a, like, it, it needs to just get less corporate. That's the only, with, only thing for me, less corporate. One thing they need to bring back for me, the SmackDown fist. Finally, though, I'm going to ask you... What about the SmackDown <laughs> fist? <laughs> Finally, though, uh, I'm going to ask you, and I think I know what you're going to say. Um, now Baron Corbin is no longer the Raw GM, and assuming Kurt Angle doesn't reassume that role, who needs to take over? Nobody. I, I hate authority figures. I should have brought this up before. Like the That's four, one of the main things. The four of them come out and they say, right, there's no more authority figures. And then book a match where all four of them are authority figures, one after another against Baron Corbin. And the segments where guys go backstage and say, shit. Oh. Shane, can I have a match, please? Shane, can I have a match, please? I don't want to see any of that anymore. I don't want to see wrestlers reduced to, like, people that work day to day and are scared of their bosses. I don't want authority figures, full stop. Nobody. Yes, I'm exactly the same boat as you. I mean, for Christ's sake... The idea that a heel gets punished by performing the duties in his job contract, a wrestler now, a babyface, is not 
wanting to be a star or get headline matches. He, he wants to do his job. Mm -hmm. It's pathetic, man. And it's it makes wrestlers look like geeks. It only ever worked for me with Mr. McMahon. You've had the odd good one, but not good enough to just continue this trend. Is There's ways of actually like laying out and producing a wrestling show without an authority figure. Like There can be a secretive, like, inferred process of people who make the matches together based on who the people want to see and who's performed well last. Like Not like a league system or anything formal mm. like that, just something we all can buy into without being beaten over the head with it. Mm. Oh, it makes sense that he's wrestling him because he won last week. Oh, it makes sense that we don't see him much it anymore because... it forces you to consider perception. It forces you to consider that, like, well, I do actually get that because I might not be a fan. And the you know. huge dramatic heft of when something so controversial goes down that a man has to emerge from the shadow and be the face of it all and go, no, I'm not having that. Mm. Like, basically, I wish I could say the word S-H-I-T, but you knew that was going down when Jack Tunney was like, right, yeah. coming out and putting an, an end to all this and I'm going to make a decree. Like, you knew mm. this was a major storyline to look out for when that guy came out and cut the most boring <laughs> promos of all time. Because he was admin. That's exactly, he was admin. He was a serious... He was, he was, uh, I've worked admin jobs before this ridiculous job I've worked here and I've, there's been upper management figures that I've been oh, like oh god please don't walk, walk by my desk when I'm not really doing anything right now like it's the last thing I need mm -hmm. but not in a way that I felt supplicant Jack Tunney used to be able to do that they could have kicked his head in but because he held so much authoritative power and used it so sparingly and so fairly that everyone was kind of like yeah, no, that's fine. I'm glad to respect his decision here. He was an ordinary man that did ordinary things, and he's more <laughs> over than Finn Balor ever is today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, is there any scope to have fans involved in that? Not necessarily akin to like a Cyber Sunday or a Taboo Tuesday, but more fan involvement in terms of pushing the stars that the fans clearly want to see. I'm curious to see how they follow through on that kind of promise mm. on Raw. I'm, I'm genuinely curious to see if they even sort of come up with a way that can follow through on that because it was like we were saying earlier on, you know, what if you joke about like uh, there's these wrestlers getting cheered week after week after week and we, we all kind of say, oh yeah, well, they're not going to push them so it doesn't matter, cheer how loud you like. They've basically told the audience that that's what they're going to do. Mm. So I'm curious to see how they respond to that now that they've laid that out as a possibility. You know, is it is it to try and take ownership of things like the Yes Movement and things like the booze that Roman Reigns used to receive? Is this their newest way to try and figure out how to cope with the kind of the complexities of a of a well connected fan base? It's what a one on one do what the fans want. Mm. I mean, for Christ's sake, they don't need to necessarily sell tickets anymore. That's what we've talked about this before. The paradigm is so strange now that. I find it very hard to do this job, as much of a ridiculous life as it is. Sorry, it's a, it's a very luxurious <laughs> first world problem, but like, with so much TV rights money streaming in, they can literally do what they want. It used to be that uh, we should probably push the guy that people are wanting to pay to see, otherwise they will not pay to see us. That doesn't happen anymore, but maybe they're looking at dwindling ratings mm -hmm. and the terrible live gates that they've been pulling in and thinking, you know what, there's classic principles behind what we do here and we're going to have to start adhering to them once more. Or sod all that and just get Mike Adam Lee back in because the Adam Lee originals were... You're not allowed to banter about Adam Lee anymore. Someone like... Brad Maddox. Yeah, Brad Maddox. We'll use him instead. Okay. Brad Maddox back in. Just don't make sure he doesn't swear at any live crowds and we'll be fine. Pricks. So sad, <laughs> Let us know your thoughts on all this in the comment section below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, make sure you subscribe for our podcast by searching for What Culture Wrestling on either iTunes or Spotify. My thanks to the Dudley Boys. Thank you for watching, and we will see you soon. Wrestling is loaded!